Well, I want to say hello if we haven't had the chance to meet one another personally yet. My name is Jared, and I serve as the senior pastor here. This is a full, beautiful day in the life of this community. It's been wonderful to have the brass instruments here and choir. It's a beautiful, it's been a beautiful morning of music. Uh, we also, later this morning, we're going to be welcoming 16 women and men into membership in our community for the first time and celebrating baptism as well, too. With that said, we're going to turn to the scriptures. We have been through the fall months doing a series called A Meal with Jesus, where we've been listening to many of the meals that Jesus shares with all kinds of people in the Gospel of Luke. So today's scripture reading is going to be from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. And so I'm going to invite you to pause with me. We're going to pray for a moment together, and then we'll listen to the scriptures. Let's pray. Lord, we don't always find it easy to recognize your coming among us. So join us on the way. Set our heavy hearts on fire with love for you. Meet us at the table and send us on our way rejoicing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, listen, if you would, to the word of God from Luke 24. Now, on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and were talking about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you talking about? While you, what are you discussing while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They answered, The things about Jesus of Nazareth. Now he was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. And how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death. And crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have taken place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find the body there, they came back and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said, were not our hearts burning within us? while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The BBC, which is the world's largest news organization, in 2006 enjoyed something, or did not enjoy, excuse me, something of a, something of a public embarrassment. There was one particular day in that year when there was a prospective new hire named Guy Goma who showed up to the BBC offices in London to interview for a job in their IT department. 
While he was waiting in the lobby, one of the assistant producers for BBC News rushed into the lobby in search of a, an expert guest who was due to be interviewed on BBC News that same hour named Guy Cooney. He was a technology expert who was due to be interviewed on a then ongoing lawsuit with Apple computers and its effects on the tech world and the stock market. So the assistant producer rushes into the lobby, looks at Guy Goma, who's there for his interview, and says to him, are you Guy? To which he says, yeah. She simply says, follow me. And she brought him into the studio. And then, lights, camera, and action, Guy Goma, who showed up for an IT interview, is there interviewed as a guest on live television broadcast all over the world. And this is what I love. Guy Goma went with it. He sat for the whole interview and answered all of the questions. It was near the end of the interview that one of the producers realized in a panic what they had done when Guy Cooney showed up for his interview and was sitting in the lobby totally alone. So the BBC put out a rushed and characteristically British understated acknowledgement that something bad had happened. They said afterwards, this has turned out to be a genuine misunderstanding. We've looked carefully at our guest procedures and we'll take every measure to ensure this does not happen again. This is my favorite part though. Guy Goma afterwards told the BBC, I'd be happy to come again and speak to you about any situation you'd like to talk to me about. What happened there? What happened was that they got the wrong guy. They didn't realize what guy they were talking to. And this is just what happens on the evening of the very first Easter to those two puzzled, downtrodden disciples as Jesus sneaks up on them. They don't realize the guy they're talking to for a while. And truth be told, in our own lives, often as not, neither do we. This story, on the evening of the day in which Jesus breaks loose from the tomb of death, it's an orientation for us. And how it is that we can recognize the presence of Jesus in our own lives here and now. And so I want to simply invite you for a few moments with me to join those disciples and the mysterious stranger who accompanies them on that seven-mile walk with an eye in particular for how we can come to recognize Jesus on the road of our own lives in the scriptures and as we come to the table. Now, as the story begins, <clears throat> Clopas and another disciple, who many scholars presume is probably his wife, are on a dreadful seven-mile walk from the city of Jerusalem to a little village called Emmaus. They have been disciples of Jesus. They had come to the city of Jerusalem with, for Passover with high hopes. They had expected that Jesus was the one, was the Messiah, the one God was going to work through to finally free their people from oppression. And then they watched as the very worst of imperial power and religious corruption collude to snuff out Jesus' life. They watch him betrayed, put through a kangaroo court by night, and then nailed up like a piece of meat to an execution stake outside the city walls. And they decide that they've had enough and that they're going home. So they make their way to Emmaus. Emmaus is, is where they go back to when they have completely lost direction in life. When they're confused and when hope in their life is past tense. Maybe you heard the heartbreak in those voices when they said, we had hoped that Jesus was the one. Here's what I want you to notice. It is on their way to Emmaus that Jesus sneaks up on them. And that's where Jesus comes to meet us in our lives as well, too. Jesus comes to meet us in the places, things, and people that we run to when we lose hope, when we're confused, when life gets dark, when we just want to self-medicate. So 
This is the question maybe I'd, I'd, encourage, you to, I'd encourage you to wrestle with a bit as you, as you reflect on this story. Do you expect Jesus to come looking for you even in the Emmauses of your own life? Even in, the, even in the places that you go to when life gets dark, when you're flooded by disappointment, when hope feels past tense in your life. This, this story tells us, is just where Jesus loves to come and find us. Second, this story opens to us the way in which Jesus meets us in a mysterious way as we come to the scriptures. I love the moment as Jesus sidles up next to these two downtrodden disciples and coyly asks them, what are you guys talking about? And flabbergasted after they unfold that they've been talking about the the tragic events of the last days, Luke tells us that Jesus chuckles at them. Oh, how slow of heart you are to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then... He goes on to open the story of the scriptures to them. Now, wouldn't you have loved to have been a part of that Bible study? Jesus says to them, wasn't it necessary that the Messiah, God's God's promised one that he was going to work through, wasn't it necessary that he should suffer and then enter his glory? Isn't Isn't it the strange way of God and the world to work not in spite of heartbreak and suffering, but through it? And then Luke tells us, Jesus unfolds to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. I think that that little line is is tremendously helpful to us because it opens to us what the scriptures are for. In a sentence, we have the scriptures to lead us to Jesus. Jesus is what the scriptures are about. As one mentor of mine said, from Genesis to maps. I think that this is a a helpful thing for us to keep in mind because, to be frank, people sometimes do weird things with the scriptures. You know, we don't have the scriptures to tell us the age of the planet. We don't have the scriptures to tell us what the winning Powerball numbers are going to be this week. And we don't have the scriptures to to tell us how you can work on your stock portfolio or have happier pets in your life or, or any of those kinds of things. The scriptures are meant to lead us to Jesus, to tell us the story of God creating us and rescuing us in Jesus Christ. There's one leading biblical scholar named N.T. Wright who says that the scriptures are, in a phrase, the true story of the whole world. The true story of the whole world. Now, I know that there are some of us for whom, when you hear me say something like that, Inwardly, if you're, if you're somebody for whom you, you wouldn't call yourself a follower of Jesus or, or you've been away from faith, church for a long time, inwardly you say to yourself, well, listen, that's quite a leap of faith that you believe that there's some way in which God actually speaks to us when we listen to, to these ancient texts. And I want to say to you, if that's you, that that's true. It, it is quite a leap of faith. There's a, there's a professor at Boston College named Stephen Prothero who wrote an wrote a op-ed sounding this same note several years ago in the Wall Street Journal. He says, he says it this way. He says, any claim of revelation is outrageous. It presumes that God exists, that God speaks, and that all is not lost when human beings translate that speech into ordinary language. Listen, he is exactly right. But here's what I want you to see. It is not only Christians who make ultimate leaps of faith like this. No matter who you are, you do as well too. If you're somebody who says, listen, I'm a, I'm a 21st century secular person. I only believe things that can be proven in a laboratory or a test tube. That, that is a leap of, that is an unprovable leap of faith. That is a leap of faith that most of the world's population today and most of the people who've ever lived in the world don't believe. It's a leap of faith. If you're somebody who says, listen, I I, I just can't believe that that only one of the world's faiths or spiritualities or whatever could claim to be true in in any real unique way. That's a leap of faith. That's a leap of faith that most of the world doesn't believe. 
And through human history, most people haven't believed. So the question isn't, will you or won't you make leaps of faith in your life? It's just, why do we make this leap of faith? In a word, what I would say to you is, we make this leap of faith because of Jesus. Because even though it explodes our mental circuits, we believe that the best, most intellectually honest case for what happened on the very first Easter morning is that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead and is thus who he says he is. And so we can trust that God speaks to us and all isn't lost. And so I want to I want to invite you, I want to challenge you. Come come to the scriptures to hear God addressing us in Jesus. Come to them here uh, in worship. Come to them in your own life. Cultivate an attentive ear for the way that God addresses us in Jesus Christ in the pages of Scripture. Last, this story unfolds to us the way in which we come to recognize Jesus and be transformed by him as we come to his table. As they approach the village of Emmaus, Clopas and his spouse and uh, and their mysterious companion are walking together, and then he begins to walk ahead. And Jesus, in that moment, does what you do when you're visiting with somebody and you hope to get asked to stay for dinner, and, but you don't want to be so pushy as to just say it. He walks ahead, he says, I've really got to get going, and they're like, no, 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 stay. And so he's like, okay, well, I guess I will. So Jesus sits down to a simple spread of bread and wine. And then, in that moment, the guest becomes the host. Jesus takes, blesses, breaks, gives. And in that moment, Luke tells us their eyes are opened and they recognize him. And then after they've run the seven now joyous miles back to Jerusalem, what is it that they tell their astonished friends? Jesus is risen and he was made known to us in the breaking of the bread. Now, uh, there is... First, a, a practice for us to emulate. If you've been with us through this series, you likely recognize the quartet of verbs that Luke uses in this passage. As, Jesus, as Luke tells us the story of Jesus feeding the masses and then coming to his last supper and then here having a first dinner on the other side of the grave with his disciples. And then as Luke goes on to tell us about the worship of the early Christian communities, he uses those same four verbs that, that we take, bless, break, give. Jesus takes, blesses, breaks, and gives. The point is that when we come to Jesus' table, as we will in a moment, like those disciples, we come to realize that Jesus is here and with us. A second, there's a picture of, of what we're called to be in Palm Beach as well, too, in this story. There's an intentional echo near the conclusion of the, of the passage as Luke is telling us what's happening to these disciples as their eyes come to be opened. The Bible actually begins with another meal as well, too, and it's quite a disastrous one. I don't, I don't know if you've ever been a part of a dinner party that's gone wrong. Somebody overcooks the chicken or you're meeting another couple for a double date and they break up in the car ride on the way there, something like that. The Bible begins with a, with a disastrous meal as the early humans, they take and eat against the wisdom and teaching of God and in so doing, turn their backs on God and shame and heartbreak enters the world. Here on the other side of Jesus' death and resurrection, as he sits down to a table with these confused disciples, Luke uses the exact same phrase, that their eyes were opened as they come to the table and new life and transformation breaks loose in the world. Friends, this is a picture of what, what we're called to be here in Palm Beach. We're called to set a table of grace so that other people like us on the way to their own Emmaus, confused, dark, turned around, come to have our eyes opened to God's love and life-transforming grace. I'll close by, by sharing with you a favorite, favorite line from a favorite poet of mine. T.S. Eliot was the, was the greatest poet that the 20th century gave us, and the greatest poem that he wrote was a poem called The Wasteland. It is in, in many ways a stark and despairing picture of the bankruptcy of modern life, but near the end of it, 
there's a glimmer of hope and light, and it comes as Eliot makes an allusion to this story. And so I want to close by sharing these words with you. After picturing in stark terms the, the darkness of life, Eliot says this. He says to the reader, who is the third who walks always beside you? When I count, there is only you and I together, but when I look ahead up the white road, there's always another one walking beside you, gliding, wrapped in a brown mantle, hooded. I do not know whether a man or a woman, but who is that on the other side of you? Friends, I pray that on the road in your own life, as we listen to the scriptures and as we come now to the table, you would come to recognize the one who is always walking beside you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. God, we, we thank you for the way in which, in Jesus, you come among us and join us, even in the bewildered and dark places of our own journeys. We thank you for how you address us in your word and how you promise to meet us now at your table. We pray that as we've heard this good news, that we would taste it now as we come to the communion table. Amen.